as they are coming in. Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. I see the attendee list is just growing. People were waiting in the waiting room. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience. So before we get started, I'm going to be going through the process of getting us live on Facebook. So if you just give me a moment. Sorry about that, I've got to start over. I was linking, I had linked it to my personal page instead of. Now your sound's out. You got an echo there, Zenaido. Yeah, no, I just told Jennifer for sure. Down. She's across the room from me. Yes. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. I'm just getting the live feed going and then we'll get started to our secular speaker series. And um, first up today is uh, Zenaido Quintana, who is the chair of the board for Secular AZ. We'd like to welcome you and make a few announcements. Okay, thank you, Tori, uh, for, uh, for the setup and uh, for making the arrangements for us to have this, uh, this uh, uh, speaker series. Uh, this is a, a series that we are holding in cooperation with HSGP. Uh, and if you go to our website, secularaz.org, uh, you can see the schedule of events and the links uh, to sign up. We've had to go to a registration format uh, in order to minimize the chances for, for the trolling that has occurred on some of these uh, webcasts. Uh, luckily so far, we have not had any uh, any mischief, but uh, we have heard some reports that there has indeed been some. So I wanna make certain that uh, all of you are able to uh, to join in without interruption. Uh, we've had some, some great speakers. And uh, once again, we continue in a series. Uh, we've had speakers from outside of our organizations talking on issues of interest to all of us, uh, but uh, we've also wanted to feature uh, presenters who are members of our coalition uh, to tell us about their programs, to tell us about their causes. Uh, all of them have things of interest to share with all of us and uh, so that today's uh, program is uh, one of one in, in that series of, of, of uh, discussions. So uh, the format, are you going to explain the format uh, Tori? You're going to talk about the format. Okay, thank you for that. Then you're also going to introduce uh, Dr. Moore, if I'm not mistaken, right? Okay, so why don't we get started to give uh, Dr. Moore an opportunity to uh, uh, have uh, the full amount of time we can dedicate this subject. Sure. Okay, so um, just first of all, the logistics are, um, if you are watching us on Facebook, feel free to ask your questions in the chat box, and we will get those questions answered at the end of the session. Additionally, if you're here with us on Zoom, you can ask questions in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. You should see a little Q&A button, and that is where you will ask your questions. And again, we will be coming back after Dr. Moore gives his presentation. We're going to come back and have all of your questions answered. So if you have any questions throughout, feel free to just put them right in the chat. It'll go in the queue, and we'll make sure to ask the questions at the end of the presentation. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Dwight Moore with the Arizona End of Life Options. Arizona End of Life Options is committed to giving dying people a choice of how they die. Medical aid in dying is in effect in 10 states currently and allows terminally ill people in consultation with two physicians to plan their death if they're eligible. Dr. Moore is the education chair of the organization here in Arizona, and he's helped pass Death with Dignity in California and he has been a volunteer for End of Life Washington, where he helps patients navigate the law and is present with them on the day of their death. With this presentation, um, I'm not sure exactly what he's gonna be talking about because he's talked with us before about a few things, but I know he's gonna talk about um, the, what's happening here in Arizona, probably give some basics about the law. I'll let him, I'll let him go. So if you have questions at the end, uh, we will be back. So thank you very much. Dr. Moore, it's, it's for you. Thank you very much for this. I appreciate Secular Coalition and the speaker series. 
Um, what I'm going to attempt to do today is to blend together a story of a real patient who ended up using the uh, death with dignity law in Washington state with the six options we have at the end of life. Most people may know that they have six choices of the way in which we die. And I'm gonna take a risk and see if I can blend those two topics together in the same, you know, in the same lecture. Um, thank you all for tuning in. This is a courageous effort because talking about death and dying is an uncomfortable process for most of us. I'm a psychologist by training um, and I know that dealing with different trauma with parents and grandparents and sometimes our own illness and death is, uh, is a tough process. I want to do something a bit odd to start with. Um, I know this is a Zoom artificial environment, but I want you to, by yourselves, think about, take a minute to think about the last hour of your life. Transport yourself to a place where you imagine you will be in that last hour and think about who's with you, what the sounds are, is there any music playing or any noise that you're aware of, the place obviously. Take a minute to imagine that last hour. In the good old days when we actually could be together, I would ask you to share some of those observations. But let me take a risk here because I've asked this question of folks before. And my guess is that what you imagined is that you're surrounded by family. There are probably grandkids there, certainly your friends, um, that you're probably at home either in your bed or in a comfortable chair that's familiar to you. For those of you who like music, you probably have your favorite uh, tunes playing. There's a sense of probably quiet and gentleness to that hour. Um, you have planned your death so you understand what the future holds for you. And what you probably did not experience in this uh, guided fantasy is being in a hospital room hooked up to tubes with a oxygen going and a heart monitor beeping and fluorescent lights and people in blue surrounding you. So if that's close to what you imagined, then I think we're in the right ballpark. I'd like to tell you a story about a patient that I worked with in the state of Washington. Um, this client's husband phoned our office and asked for a volunteer to come visit because he said his wife wanted to use the death with dignity law. So normally what we do is get in our cars and uh, in the good old days again and drove out. And when I knocked on the door, her husband answered the door and stood in, in my way and said, I want to tell you right away, I don't support this. So being a good psychologist, I said something like, tell me more or let's sit, I want to understand this. And he spent probably at least a half an hour talking to me about his religious convictions, his lack of support for his wife's choice, um, his hesitations about this for their two daughters. And uh, my job at that point was to listen and understand and have him feel understood in his point of view. He then said, well, I guess we're ready to go meet my wife. So we went into a back bedroom and there was his wife. Um, and if you remember some of the pictures of Stephen Hawking uh, in the latter parts of his life, um, he had ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, the, the musculature nerve processes start to go haywire for folks and they get frozen. She was able to communicate by a computer where she, with her index finger, typed messages and answers to my questions. Um, she had a feeding tube because she wasn't able to swallow anymore. This patient probably weighed maybe 95 pounds um, and was absolutely crystal clear in her thinking, um, passionately committed to the idea of planning her death as soon as possible. Um, 
And while she understood her husband's hesitations, she was clear that this was her choice. She had tried all medical possible treatments over the past two or three years. I said I was going to try to weave together the six options we have at the end of life. One of those options is doing all that's medically possible, trying every possible treatment, and that she had tried. The second option we have is to do nothing, to stop all medical treatment. And she then, once the treatments did not work, she went to that modality. So those are the first two options we have. In talking to her, um, one of the, I realized that one of the criteria for being able to use medical aid in dying is to be able to self-administer the medication. Since she had a feeding tube, that meant she needed to be able to inject the syringe that fed her. Her physician, one of the two doctors who was consulting with her as to whether she were eligible or not for the law, was not sure she had the strength to self-inject through the feeding tube. So he was initially going to deny her access to the law. Um, I had developed a relationship with him over time and asked if we could do a trial to see if she were able to do that. He agreed to that. So the next visit out, um, her husband filled her natural feeding tube. It's a syringe, large looking syringe. And I watched as she, with both arms, forearms and hands, pushed down on this syringe and was able to feed herself. That was a sufficient information for the doctor to agree that she was then eligible because she needed to be self-sufficient in order to do that. We talked a little bit about setting a date. It's difficult for these patients to actually say, well, yeah, you know, on Wednesday of next week at two o'clock, I'm going to take the medication because she was so determined and so far progressed in her illness, she had less trouble than normal on that. So we set a date for the next Monday. Her daughters were flying in from elsewhere. And I sat again with a husband to talk through his concerns. At that point, uh, it's probably two or a week or so into my relationship with them. He said that while he still didn't support the law, he was supportive of her and loved her um, so she set the date. Um, what happens in this situation is, and I hope this isn't more information than you wanted. What happens is that the patient takes a pre-medication, which is an anti-nausea medication to prevent uh, somebody from regurgitating the medication itself. That rarely happens, but it occasionally does. The pre-medication takes about an hour to take effect. She wanted to be in her bedroom surrounded by her two daughters. Um, so uh, we, we moved her into that uh, comfortable space for her. Um, we mixed the medication itself. There's four pharmaceuticals that we use. If you're interested in the question and answer period, we can talk in more detail about what those are. Those uh, four were mixed up into her feeding tube again. Um, and then brought to her. And again, she went through the process um, of answering two questions, which we ask just prior to when people are using the medication. One question is, are you being, have you been coerced to use this medication? And she obviously has to say no. And the second question is, do you understand what will happen when you take this? And she also, in order to be of sound mind, approve it, she has to be able to describe what's going to happen, which she did with clarity. She then put the syringe over her feeding tube and again with what looked like Herculean effort to me, pushed the medication into her stomach. Um, I, the, her daughters were crying, but it was saying goodbye. My job at that point as a volunteer is to try to move out of the room um, and allow the process to continue. Uh, about a week prior to that, um, usually the volunteer walks the family through what's going to happen after the patient takes the medication. And the normal course of this is that within a period of five minutes or so, they fall into a deep sleep. And then at a certain point, usually about an hour and a half later, they die from the medication. The time of that varies um, because this particular uh, patient was extremely vulnerable and advanced in her disease state. Um, she said 
uh, I think she set a record, uh, she died in six minutes. Uh, and that surprised everybody because uh, it was, it's out of the bell curve. Um, her, she was calm, um, grateful. There was a, a nobility to this process. There's no trauma, there's no anxiety that's visible. Um, the dying process itself sometimes uh, it results in some gurgling in the breathing. Um, she, she demonstrated almost none, none of that because of the speed. Um, her family um, felt comfortable with this to the extent that they can uh, because everything proceeded on schedule and as she wished. Um, during, the, during the time where she took the medication, her husband moved from the corner of the room to her bed. Sorry. And, and was able to hold her hand. The, the next steps are more pragmatic steps in terms of um, funeral arrangements, crema cremation, whatever they decided. Um, and then we, because I'm not a medical professional, uh, get a declaration of death, usually from the hospice worker who's uh, part of the process. Um, and what's listed in the death certificate is the illness, the terminal illness that the patient has. And all of that happened for this particular client. So let me go back to the six choices we have. The first one is all medical treatment possible. Second is no medical treatment. The third choice, which we haven't talked about yet, is palliative care or palliative sedation. This is a process toward the end of one's life where there's a lot of discomfort, anxiety, loss of autonomy, pain in some cases. And the medical staff in consultation with the family um, figures out a way to pharmaceutically medicate the patient so that they're comfortable. Palliative sedation. Um, palliative sedation itself, other than palliative care, is a last minute, last, sorry, not minute, but every two or three days before death where the patient is actually put into a coma so that they're comfortable uh, if they're experiencing a great deal of pain or anxiety. So that's the third one, palliative sedation, palliative care. Number fourth is hospice care. And my guess is most of you have experience with this with your grandparents or parents. A hospice job is to keep you comfortable until the natural disease state takes your life. They are not in the business of killing patients. They're not in the business of, die, of helping people die. Uh, it's a careful, caring approach that hospice uses. The fifth, Option we have is something called voluntary stopping eating and drinking. Um, as some of you probably know, Tori said that there's nine states right now in the District of Columbia that have the law of death with dignity so that we can access this medication. To die is voluntary stopping eating and drinking. My father made this choice. Um, in his 94th year because his the coach, that's what he called me. He said, coach, come on in, you gotta help me do this. Um, basically this process is exactly as it sounds. You make a decision that you're going to stop all intake of fluids and all food. You need Need a team of them comfortable. You can imagine getting extremely thirsty or extremely uh, hungry. There are ways to moisten lips and keep the tongue from drying out. And but the process is difficult. Usually, folks are on hospice care during stopping eating and drinking, so that the medications again exist to keep you comfortable from a pain and again an anxiety standpoint. The body after about four days starts to go into a coma, a slow coma. You really don't have any desire anymore for drinking or eating. Um, those of you who have known people who have died probably noticed that toward the end of the last month or so of their lives, they really weren't interested in eating anymore, although everybody around them wants them to eat. So 
Um, and then with the voluntary stopping eating and drinking, and the body at some point finally shuts down and dies naturally. And then the sixth choice, which I've just told you the story about, is medical aid in dying, also known as death with dignity, where you can plan your death if you are eligible. Six month terminal illness, two doctors agree that you have a terminal illness. You're sane, that means you can make medical decisions and you're able to self administer. So thank you for letting me tell that story and try to weave it together. Um, as Tori said, I'm here in Arizona. We are focused on trying to get the legislature to pass this law. Our vision is to get a number of campaigns, including one we call the Seven Touches, where it's for over a period of seven months, we are reaching out to each legislator and, and the candidates for the November election to inform them of medical aid in dying. Um, if you have an interest in looking at our website to figure out what we're doing in detail, it's called choicesarizona.org. Choicesarizona.org. That gives you a lot more information than I'm able to do in this session. Um, we, like most nonprofits, and I'm sure in your organizations, have a need for volunteers who are willing to give us an hour to two hours, three hours a month to support the campaigns, the education, the contacting the press, and so on and so forth. So uh, on the website, there's a, a place to volunteer if you have a desire. Um, I'm going to wrap it up at this point, Tori. Um, I think I'm pretty much on time uh, and see if there are questions. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Moore, that was, as always, um, I think I've, I've heard you, I've, I think I've heard you give this talk now three times and every time it gets me. Um, and uh, so I just, want to thank you the stories of the people who have chosen this we do have some questions for you that have been coming in so let me start with this one um, the question is what percentage of people that start the counseling actually complete the process uh, one third one third yeah let me may I add one paragraph to that please do um, there is great comfort in having the medication either at the pharmacy or in your possession. And a number of patients just say, well, I'm okay now, I'm gonna just live as long as I can. And then they die naturally instead of taking the medication. So that accounts for some of that two thirds of a difference. Other patients, the, their death sneaks up on them. We, we might say, I wanna set to next week on Wednesday to, to die, but it comes sooner than that. And we can't predict that. Um, and then the final piece, which is it can't be uh, understated, is that there's great comfort in knowing that you're not going to live those last hours or days or weeks with a loss of autonomy, a loss of dignity, uh, excruciating pain, and the anxiety that goes along with uh, terminal illness. Okay. Um, let's see, we have another question for you. You. Can you talk a little bit about some of the specific laws and measures you are trying to bring to the Arizona legislature? Yes. What does it look like? Um, the law itself is a medical aid in dying law. It's modeled after Oregon's law, which Oregon is the first state that passed this 20 years ago. And all other states have modeled, have the same model basically um, for this law. There's some small differentiations in language, but fundamentally the law, the model's exactly the same. We're, there's some bells and whistles that some states have on theirs that we're not including here because we're a relatively conservative state, so we don't want to panic people unnecessarily. Um, so we have what I would call model 101 here, uh, the basic right to plan your death if you have a terminal illness and are of sound mind. Can you tell us a little bit about who are the main people fighting for this here in Arizona? Who, who is fighting for this? And also, can you give us an idea of who's fighting against this? Yeah, we've, we've been um, fortunate to involve 
two national associations, one called Compassion and Choices, the other one called Death with Dignity, um, in our cause. And we are in monthly communication with their staff and their resources. They're being wonderfully supportive. Your organization, Secular Coalition, has been fabulously supportive, inviting us today, for example, and uh, spreading the word for us. So we appreciate that and thank you very much for that. Um, in terms of the state, that's basically it. Um, as far as we know, there are no competitors to this. Um, there are a couple of variations on, on the theme of this. Um, there's an organization in Tucson that runs what they call the final exit, which is a different kind of death. I didn't speak about that. It's a different topic. Um, and we are aware of each other, but there's no competition. It's just that's not relevant. The opposition is the Center for Arizona Policy, Kathy Herod, the, the governor, uh, Catholic churches and diocese, Catholic diocese leadership mostly, not necessarily the parishioners. And some of the leadership of the medical community. Again, not physicians, the majority of physicians in Arizona support this law, but their organizations have been reluctant to take a neutral stance about it. So that's the opposition. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Molly wants to know if you could share the four medications that are used. Is that something? Yeah, if I can remember them. <laughs> um, there, there are two cardiac medications, uh, digoxin and Valium. People are probably aware of those. Digoxin in small doses is used for a blood pressure medication and Valium. Uh, morphine is the primary ingredient in this uh, cocktail or the formulation. And then um, the fourth one I'm going to remember, uh, propanenol, which is also cardiac medication. Uh, and the and it's mixed, it's a basically a powder when it's received from the pharmacy. And we as volunteers or the family members can mix it in approximately about a quarter of a cup of liquid. Vodka, by the way, is the choice, the, the liquid of choice for people. Um, and uh, simple and easy to swallow as a result. Yeah. The uh, one other thought about that, Tori, uh, because there are two kinds of medications, uh, one works obviously on the cardiac system and the other on the respiratory system. So uh, it basically helps the body just shut down those systems. And while we're on that topic, we have uh, two questions um, that are kind of similar, I think. One is, what do you think of using nitrogen? And the other is, I've heard there's a quick process using inert gases. What about that? So those yeah. kind of seem similar. So they are pretty similar. Uh, I'm not an expert on either of them. Um, this is gonna sound like I'm begging the question, but I believe strongly in the freedom of choice, as I'm sure many of the folks watching today. So um, I think if it's legal and, and you're an adult, and you have a choice, then it's a decision you need to make. There are advantages and pluses and minuses. Another question is, does, does it have to be done at home? Hmm. What if someone is in the hospital or a nursing home? Yeah, great question. Um, probably 90% of these are done at home. Hospitals have no interest in having this done on their premises, so they're quite likely to say, sorry, you can't do it. You've got to move the patient to a nursing home or home or somewhere. Nursing homes, uh, about half of the nursing homes allow this to occur on their premises and half do not. And that's a policy issue as to who's the owner, quote unquote, of the room in which that resident uh, resides. The um, saddest situation on this was a, a guy that I volunteered with who was ready to take the medication, was in a nursing home, who had a policy that he could not do it there, um, but he had no money and nowhere to go and no, absolutely no family. So what we did was we uh, moved him to a $60 a night hotel and in the hotel, we, he took his medication and we needed to then call the coroner's office because he had no money for any kind of funeral arrangements to come and pick up his body from the hotel. Uh, luckily, we don't have that occur as often, but that's the breakdown in terms of where this uh, people normally take meds. So here's a here's a question. Um, someone with the with the onset of dementia wants to die with dignity. 
They still have a sound mind at the time of the decision. However, do not want to go until they are unable to remember the decision and to die in the matter they have chosen. Is that an option? Uh, so the two questions we asked just prior to the patient taking the medication are, do you understand what's going to happen when you take this medication? If that patient in that moment is unable to answer that question, we withdraw the medication. And I got to tell you, that's traumatic for everybody. That's happened to me in a 50 plus deaths twice when the progress of the dementia had advanced from being of sound mind with initial contact to no longer capable of making informed medical decisions at the time they wanted to swallow the medication. This is um, the tough part of this law, Victoria. Is, uh, those folks do not have eligibility. Is there any option for people um, for non-medical reasons? That was one of the, that was one of the questions that came through. It said, are there any major, oh, uh, right, so non-medical physician assisted, yeah. this is physician assisted suicide, but we don't, we don't use that term. That's not what this is. Um, and, and maybe you can also address that too in that, that why we don't call it, Good. why words matter. So those are the two questions. Yeah, so I worked with a client who had been hit at 60 miles an hour by an automobile as she was crossing the street. There wasn't a bone in her body that wasn't broken. And she had developed such tolerance for opiates that she no longer could tolerate the pain. The dilemma of situations for non, what you talk with your language is non-medical, right? Was, yeah. is that there's no terminal illness for those folks. And that disqualifies them. You have to be, the science has to be able to say, yes, this has terminal illness. So it's a dilemma for people with ALS, for example, and Parkinson's and some of these where there is not an obvious endpoint like there is for pancreatic cancer or one of, the, one of those other disease states. So the answer is no, people are not eligible. In that case, what I would recommend is voluntary stopping eating and drinking or the final exit, which is the inert gas um, option. Now you ask a second part. Um, the second part was, I just wanted you to kind of talk about why we don't actually call it physician assisted suicide and, and why words matter. Yeah. So quick story on this is a psychologist I had training in a suicide prevention hotline. And I was lucky enough to get the night shift for a year. Um, and dealt with a number of people who were ready to commit suicide, some of which did, some of which did not. Um, the, the reality psychologically of being suicidal is 180 degrees diametrically opposed from death with dignity patients. With the death with dignity patients, they're, they're quiet, there's a, there's a certitude about it, there's a um, calmness to them. They've thought it through. They've tried other options. They want to live. They don't want to die. They want to spend more time with their grandchildren. They know that they're not going to. On the flip side, suicide ideation is horrible. Clinical depression, incredible amounts of sadness, inappropriate sadness, total, totally uh, anxiety ridden. Um, there's, a violent, there's a violence to suicide when there's not in death with dignity. Um, and usually suicidal patients die alone because they understand their families don't want to participate. Um, and and well, the details of that will let go. This is not suicide. I can, I can guarantee you from a psychological standpoint, this is not. Okay, there was a few comments or questions on um, final exit. And I know you said you were not final exit, um, but I'm just going to run over these for you real fast. Um, Mary says, just FYI, Arizona's final exit has changed their name to Choices and Dignity Incorporated. And um, Marshall wanted to know if Choice and Dignity and John Abraham were working with you, but I believe you answered that, but if you just want to clarify one more time. Yeah, in, John and I are in communication, um, but we've agreed that we're separate choices. And so we're keeping the organizations and the fundraising and all that stuff separately. Okay. 
Um, so then we had a few uh, logistical questions, which um, I just want to remind everybody that, that we don't actually have this law in Arizona. This isn't something we can do here necessarily. So, um, but the questions are, um, Stephanie wants to know how much this costs. Is it expensive? Yeah, good, good question. There are two choices in medication right now. The compound I talked about is about six to $700. The other choice is second all, and that is current price is around $7,000. $7,000. Seven thousand. Wow, is it pretty easy to get these to in states where it's legal? It's is it easy, easy to, to do? Get the compound. Second all is a European manufacturer. They limit the amount that they allow in the United States for political reasons. They do not believe in capital punishment, and so they have limited their second all from coming in because of that reason. Okay. One more question I see here this kind of a logistical question is is um if uh somebody has a friend or family member who has decided to go down this path for their end of life how do they how would um how could you be a volunteer at a at a death and to be a volunteer at, at the time of death for for states that have this uh there is uh, most of them, if not all, have volunteer organizations you can get in touch with, and they will fix you up in lots of different ways. So they need help. All of us need help with this. Um, for states which do not have the law, the closest that you can volunteer would be through hospice, a hospice house. Lots of great out volunteer opportunities for them. Uh, hospice of the Valley has probably 10 to 15 networks here, uh, organizations. So that would be the way I do it in that sense. Um, for people here in Arizona or have connections in Arizona, I want to, we would love some volunteer if you have some, I know everybody's quite busy uh, in this world right now, but we would love some volunteer help. And you can access that again through our web website, choicesarizona.org. Great. Here's something I'm going to learn. Um, Molly has a question. Does Arizona have any most or post laws? I don't know what that is, M-O-L-S-T-P-O-L-S-T. -O 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 it's an advanced directive which you put normally on your refrigerator. So if you collapse in your house, first responders know what your wishes are about how heroic measures they could take to revive you on the way to the hospital. And the, it's called P-O-L-S-T. Um, all physicians should have a copy of that. Um, the question is, does, it, does, does Arizona have a requirement for that? and I don't know the okay. answer. And um, this is a great question. Priscilla would like to know specific ways on how she can help get this law passed in Arizona. Open up our website, click on volunteer, and we'll give you about 132 ways. <laughs> and we just actually made a list. So a lot of things to do. So um, I saw on here too, one of the questions was, um, how long is it, have we been trying to get this passed in? And I can say that um, I, it has been, I think 21 sessions consecutive now that this law in some way, shape or form has been introduced at our Arizona yeah. State Legislature. And uh, it hasn't received a committee hearing, no public hearing whatsoever. The bill's been dead every year on arrival as far as I know which is hopefully going to change, but that is, that's my understanding. Dr. Moore, if you have different information on that. Nope, we uh, remain passionate um, and dedicated to this, but yeah, it's been tough. Yeah, so um, just to give a little perspective too, um, politically, we have already received some re responses back from our survey. Our, our candidate survey of which we are asking candidates their position on certain issues and this is one of the issues we've asked and one of the responses I received back was from an angry Republican who basically um, um, he said um, this is murder would never support it what would you what would you recommend because I'm I, I think that he just needs to understand a little better um, that this is not m murder what would you what would you recommend when we 
talk with other, it doesn't have to be elected officials necessarily, but, you know, people who say, oh, this is murder, this is murder. How would you recommend that we approach those conversations? I would uh, affirm his point of view that it, I understand he believes it's murder. And so I would never request he or any of his family members to use this choice at the end of their lives. I ask if you'd be willing to have me go over the other choices that they have that I talked about today. Um, what I would ask him is if he chooses not to use this, that he not limit my choice to use it. There's a clear boundary there and uh, that boundary needs to be made for these folks. I totally respect his decision not to use mm -hmm. this law. Mm -hmm. And I, um, Dr. Moore, um, you had come to the Capitol at one point this session and given the same talk to a group of lawmakers. And um, I just want to share with the group that there was another Republican who came to that meeting who came in with this, you know, he, um, he had a preconceived notion of what this was. And when he left the meeting, he had a completely new understanding. And in fact, he even said to us that this is something he could possibly consider supporting. Um, in your experience, is, is there any reason why this is, or uh, I mean, is this really a partisan issue or is this just a matter of education and, and, and helping people to understand? I think this is an issue of values. Um, so it's not partisan. Um, it's a it's a patient law. It's not a doctor law or a legislative law or my law. It's about patient care and it's about underlying values about where choice lies in our lives. Um, that's how I would discuss it with these folks. Um, there's kind of a vapor barrier, you know. I think you can only go so far when some if the, for your buddy who's saying it's murder, I, I would never attempt to change his mind or spend a whole lot of time doing it. Um, but there are more middle ground folks. I talked recently to a candidate down in LV2, a woman named Dorothy McEwen, I believe you spell, it's spelled, who is Republican and Christian and fully supports this law. And it's delightful to hear that they're not, they're not conflicted about this. They're very clear. So I don't like to frame it as, uh, as, as a partisan issue. It, it, that doesn't get us anywhere. I completely agree. It's 100% it's nonpartisan. And um, I think uh, from where I sit, it just seems like we just need a more education as uh, I've talked um, at the state legislature. Uh, we did, we did, you did have a bill last session that um, I just want to let everyone know about. It's House Bill, let me get the number for you. I think it's 2582. 2582, yes, yes. So it's House Bill 2582. If you, if, if uh, anyone watching today would like to look it up to read exactly what is being proposed, it's all out there, House Bill 2582. And we can um, add a link to that in the uh, in the chat box, maybe. Uh, maybe Lindsay can do that. She's she's kind of working the back end for us right now. Um, another question came in. Do, do people go to other states to be able to end uh, their yeah. lives under these they laws? Go to other states and other countries. Um, the process of going to another state is you need to establish residence either by having a lease or obviously purchase agreement for a home. You um, need, so that's primary criteria. Um, the doctors will ask you for that to determine your residency. Um, and then the second piece obviously is to find two physicians who will support the fact that you have terminal illness and write the script. This, th that's the harder part. It's easier to establish residence. Um, you could just go to the DMV if they're open um, and change your driver's license. And that then gives you residence in another state. Switzerland, um, the Netherlands, Belgium, all, uh, all have laws uh, that allow folks to come into the country for a pretty hefty fee and die with dignity there. Um, those systems are more what they're called euthanasia. So they're doctor, those is, that is doctor assisted death as opposed to what we do here is self adjusted. Okay, thank you. And um, another question on cost, related to cost is, 
Um, is something like this covered under any insurance policies? Um, occasionally, certain insurance policies will cover it and others do not. So this is like any insurance question. Does your particular insurance agency cover it or not? Oregon and Washington recently had Medicare cover this cost for, uh, for their patients. Um, but again, that's going to vary depending on the policy. Okay. Let's see if I have any more questions here. I'm, I have, there's so many, but I think I've asked most of them. Uh, it's a history of trying to get this passed. We've been trying. And I, I do believe that there is momentum in the next few years for this to be successful. And I think it has a lot to do with the public education campaigns that have been, um, that you have done, that others have done over the last several years, sharing stories. Um, I think that that is one of the biggest things that we can do is just to humanize this, that it's not, it's not a political issue. It's not a partisan issue. It's, it's a human issue. And it's something that it's about having control over, over your life and your death. Um, let's see. So it's low, I asked that one. So Tori, one, one little fact about that. We're, uh, pushing a new initiative to do virtual house parties. And I have this lovely image of somewhere in Bull Rush City, Arizona. We find eight people who are willing to Zoom with us and do a discussion just like this. Oh, that's great. And we're hoping to do it all over the state in, in the smaller towns and the more out of the way places than the two main cities, so. Well, I'll tell you that um, I just reviewed the, the questions and it had come up several times not just from, from one person, that there are a lot of people on this call who want to be more involved and want to know what they can do, write letters, make phone calls. Um, so uh, if you could just repeat your website once again, uh, make sure everybody knows where to go. Yes, it's choicesarizona.org. And that gives, us, that gives you a couple contact places as well as a little thing to tap tap to fill out a volunteer form. Those are the best ways to get in touch with us. Okay. And it looks like we are putting um, into the chat box. We have the bill. Thank you, Lindsay, for putting the bill in. And I've invited Zenaido back. Um, Dr. Moore, did you have anything else you'd like to close with? Yes. I want to thank you personally because of all the help you've given us in the legislature and also Secular Arizona because it's been a great support coalition and we look forward to our continuing relationship with you. Thank you. Thank you. Zenaido? Yes, uh, and thank you, Dr. Moore. This is uh, the second time I've heard your, uh, your presentation and uh, uh, the last time was a few months ago and for some reason each time I hear it, it seems to get a little more immediate. So I wanna thank you once again for, for that. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, one of the questions I had actually for you, Tori, that uh, you didn't get to, but I'm, I'm going to ask it now. Uh, the mechanics of getting uh, one of these uh, measures, uh, one of these bills introduced in the legislature, is it dependent primarily on the leadership in the legislature? Do we have to get to the, the speaker or the president or how do we do that? Who is the person who can make the decision? Sure. So, so thank you. That's a great question. The, the way this all works is getting a bill introduced is just a matter of finding a bill sponsor and they introduce the bill. So that's, that's the easy part. Actually having a bill, introducing it means it has a bill number and it's an official part of the legislative session. Now, the harder part is getting the committee hearing and moving the bill along. So the legislature um, bill bills have to go through process. They have to have a committee hearing. They have to be go through rules they have to be heard on the floor and voted on the floor and then move to the next chamber so if it never gets to that committee hearing the very first step then then it's a dead bill so the committee chairs are the people who decide what goes on their agendas and um, the committee chairs are chosen by the speaker of the house or the president of the senate and so a lot of this comes back to to um 
who is in charge at the legislature, who the leadership is. And if this is something the leadership gets behind, the president of the Senate or the Speaker of the House, they want this bill to move, they will make sure it gets a committee hearing. They will make sure it gets into whatever committee they want it to get in, and then it, it will move. And um, the way things happen at the Capitol, right now is um, if the Speaker of the House or the President of the Senate really doesn't want a bill to be heard, um, they have complete power over that and they will make sure that it doesn't move along in the process or that it never gets heard in the first place. So it comes back to leadership. And so the targets for education are not only the 90 individual members of the legislature who all have their own opinion about things and how things should go, but really honing in on the leaders there. And then of course you will need, if, if we get to the point where we can move it through the legislature, you will need the governor as well to sign that legislation and not veto it. And so there is a lot of work to be done in public education, but it's definitely on the majority in the legislature of whether or not a bill will be heard. So, so the, the, in a practical matter, in order to get a bill to get on the floor, we need to have a sponsor and have the support of the leadership of at least one of the one of the chambers. Yes, that's exactly yeah. it. Okay, so we've got we've actually got a relatively small uh, target number of targets that we can aim for. Uh, I'm assuming I know I know you've you've tried to get uh, meetings with uh, some of these uh, uh, leaders in the past. Some have been receptive and some have not. Uh, in, in your meetings with them, can you get a sense of whether or not they support legislation of this type? I know you got a lot of stuff that you go through each time to try to, to feel them out on, uh, on what will fly and what won't. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I can tell you that the, um, the majority right now do not support this type of legislation, mostly because they are, um, they are he heavily influenced by the Center for Arizona Policy and the, um, the Catholic Bishops Association that also lobbies the legislature right now, um, the Alliance Defending Freedom. There are some big lobbying groups that we are working up against who have convinced the leadership that this is something they don't want to support. And so um, while we try to change those minds at the same time, if the makeup of the legislature changes, then we do have, we, we really are only like two people away from changing the way the legislature looks, changing the majority, in which case you might have a majority that would support this. If we, if there's two more people that get added, you could have a majority that supports this. It could be heard. Um, it, it, I certainly don't think the governor Ducey would sign this legislation, but it would be um, just amazing to actually have a public hearing so we can have public dialogue um, input, people can actually have a conversation about this very complex issue instead of just ignoring it session after session. Like, let's actually sit down and have a conversation. And, and that would be just a wonderful next step if we could make that happen next session. Yeah, I saw another question and just pop out about a ballot measure or referendum. Uh, is it possible? Of course it's possible, but they're extremely costly, are they not? Yeah, ballot ballot initiatives usually are around three million dollars. Um, you have to get signatures, and normally you have to pay for those signatures. Unless you're amazing, like the teachers and uh, Save Our Schools Arizona, they they did all of theirs with um, volunteers. Um, but that's really unheard of. So yeah, doing a referendum would be easily $3 million. So if there is a very rich person in the state who wants to bankroll that, um, give me a call. Let's let's talk. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Moore can uh, can speak about whether or not any of these uh, states that have approved of these measures, if any of them have done it via the referendum process. Uh, yes, two or three of them did. I'm, I'm not going to be able to remember exactly which ones. Um, they had a bigger bankroll than we have. Our balance is zero, um, so mm -hmm. we're all we're all volunteers. Uh, but it has been done in, by referendum. It also has been done by court order and then also obviously vote by legislature. Do you know which state did the court order, Dr. Dr. Moore? I'm gonna guess Montana, but I, I don't have my notes in front of me, I apologize. Okay. Okay, well, thank you once again, Dr. Moore, for your, your uh, illuminating 
uh, comments. Uh, we wish you all the best and we'll continue obviously to work uh, with your organization to support your efforts because it is very much a part of our uh, core values and uh, the core values of almost all of our, uh, all of our members. So thank you so much uh, for uh, being at the forefront uh, there. We will continue to do all we can to push that agenda forward. Before we close, uh, I want to first thank Tori for her usual uh, support and her uh, enthusiasm in, uh, in communicating with all of us. And also behind the scenes to Lindsay Evans, our uh, uh, Director of, of uh, Development and also does a lot of our administration. Uh, I want to thank Lindsay, who is not on screen, uh, but she also does a great job for us. And I want to remind everybody that this series, again, uh, will continue. Uh, on the 27th, Saturday the 27th, one week from today, we're going to go a little out of cycle and we'll have a presentation at 2 p.m. Uh, June the 27th, Saturday, the Honorable Elysia Sears, uh, who's the uh, Justice of the Peace in West Mesa. And uh, I understand the state's youngest elected official. And do you know, do you have the topic, uh, name of her topic, uh, title of her topic, Tori? So I asked her and she said, well, we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> she's, uh, she, she's so dynamic. She's been giving these talks on Facebook, which is why I invited her. So I'll let everybody know she's been giving these talks on Facebook, um, just talking about black history and just a lot of really good, interesting information that I had never heard before. And so that is why I reached out to her to see if she would like to come join us. And because she is really interested in educating and talking with folks about race and racism, among other things, but she may choose to talk about something else. I said, you know, give her the floor. She's, she's just so amazing. I hope everybody comes because you will definitely um, get something out of it. Yeah. Like yeah, for, for uh, a lot of obvious reasons, so those are all topics that are ex very much in the news these days, and it would be great to, to have someone who is intimate in the movement and uh, been, been involved uh, to be able to address that issue for us. Um, on Sunday, the, the following day, uh, the 28th of uh, June, uh, Izzy Oldfield, who is a member of the American Humanist Association, is going to address the topic of defending the wall between church and state in today's uh, environment, today's climate. Now, this is going to be on Sunday, which is part of the uh, HSGP speak, speaker series. Like I said, we, we, we tend to alternate with them. Uh, we got a little out of cycle because they do theirs twice a month and we do ours every other week. So, uh, but I do hope you will tune into that one. And then uh, on July 18th, Saturday, July 18th at 2 p.m., uh, Senator Juan Mendes and Representative Athena Salman uh, will talk a little bit about, uh, in general, about the political climate in Arizona. Maybe uh, they would be people that we can do some follow-up questions on, on laws, such as the end-of-life option laws uh, and other laws and what the possibilities are. Um, you got anything else to add, Tori? Yes, I do. Um, okay. We also just scheduled, and it's not up yet, but I'm gonna let everybody know, our secular superstars, well, our superstars are the top people, but we have 10 people that we choose from the legislature who score the highest on our scorecard. Our scorecard will be released July 6th, and um, we are having some virtual happy hours this year. Normally we do these in person, but this year we are not doing it in person for obvious reasons. Um, but we hope that you will join us on July 7th or July 9th. We're gonna do two of them uh, because we have 10 lawmakers that we're inviting. So hopefully five and five. And it's an opportunity to get to know some of our best friends at the legislature, hear from them about what it's like to work um, for secular government, hear from us why we're even giving them an award in the first place. So these are one hour happy hours. We're gonna invite you to bring a drink. You know, we're gonna toast our secular stars, bring your own beverage, join us from the comfort of your own home and get to know our secular stars a little better July 7th and 9th. And again, well, we will put those up on the website probably this weekend. Yeah, let me just add to that, Tori. Uh, when we started this process, how long was it? Six years ago or so? About six this years. Our, we, yes. had, we had, uh, you know, onesie-twosie candidates that, that we could uh, pick. 
And uh, the last couple of years, we've had a tough time uh, getting it down to 10, the top 10. So uh, Tory's efforts at the legislature have definitely paid off and a persistence in, uh, in continuing to, uh, to say in their face, if you will, with all our sets of issues uh, has certainly paid off. So uh, we, as, uh, as, as Dr. Moore mentioned, uh, every nonprofit organization, particularly in today's environment, uh, has a tough time uh, making ends meet and finding funds to do their work. Uh, sector coalition and sector communities for Arizona is no no different. So I, I uh, ask you and urge you to please go to our website, sectorazy.org, and uh, donate what you can. Um, we have an excellent network of volunteers, but there's some things that we do, uh, specifically our lobbying efforts, for example, that uh, we can't really do as volunteers. Believe me, I tried it and I found, uh, I found out how, how, uh, how futile that was and how difficult that was, frankly. And so having a professional who is there, who knows uh, the players and who has a, a friendly demeanor, as Tori obviously has, uh, has been all the difference to us in terms of our effectiveness at the legislature. So please support us as best you can and uh, volunteer. We'll, we'll be back uh, in business with live events as soon as we can. Uh, but until then, please continue to tune in on this series. Uh, we appreciate your presence and we appreciate you inviting friends to tune in as well. Thank you all.